going to receive the Lord's Supper today. And I just want to say that this is an open communion, which means it's just totally up to you. If you want to receive, if you don't want to receive, that's just whatever you feel like doing. No pressure on anybody. But I know a lot of times if you're, if you're relatively new or you're not familiar with, with what's going on in church, you feel obligated to take parts of stuff when I just want you to know that you don't have to do that. Is that all right? Surely. Father, thank you today for this word. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that it's amazing. Thank you, Lord, that I can read this without my glasses. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 26, verse 17, living, New Living. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal for you? The Passover meal. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it. For this is my blood. Actually, you know, that's a community cup right there. What do you say? We just get a big mug and fill it up with juice and we'll just take turns. No, no. Okay. For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. So the institution of the Lord's Supper took place the night before Jesus was crucified. Thus they call it the Last Supper. And actually you can see in verse 17 that we read that Jesus' followers called this Jewish Passover meal. They called it this Passover meal, which was first instituted by God in, in uh, Exodus 12. So we have his true believers versus the religious leaders. And I want you to look at the evidence of this. We'll shift gears just a little bit here. Matthew 16, 1. One day the Pharisees and Sadducees came to test Jesus, demanding that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. You ever had somebody say, well, if God proves it to me, you know, like Thomas, if I can, yeah. Remember, the Hebrew writer tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So they're saying we want to show, you show us a sign before we believe you are the son of God. It goes on at verse 13. And actually, I'm going to play a j Dog thing here. This portion of scripture is truly one of my favorite scriptures. Now, I don't care what verse you want to turn to. That one there is j Dog's favorite verse. Yeah, and then the next one, that one there is my favorite. They're all favorite, aren't they, brother? Verse 13, Matthew 16, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, the others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? That's the most important question you will ever hear in your life. Who do you say Jesus, the Son of God, is? Jesus replied, Simon answered, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Of course, the rock was not Peter. The church was built upon. It was the revelation knowledge that Peter had that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. Upon this rock of revealed knowledge, I will build my church. Verse 19, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then he sternly warned this to the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. On your handout number one, all, all of you that love the handouts, did you get one? Yes. Man, I'm hating these things more every week. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm kidding you. It actually, it actually kind of breaks the word up a little bit to where it's just, I'm actually starting to like it. That much, but it, I like it. The Pharisees and Sadducees asked for a sign from heaven to prove that Jesus was the Son of God, but knowledge gained by the flesh has no foundation. Foundation. And I've had several people complain 
because you're slow writers. I believe Jesus wanted, wants people to know him by the Spirit. Because knowledge gained by the flesh has no foundation. Flesh and blood, he said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter, but my Father in heaven. Number two, spiritual discernment, gnosko, always trumps, trumps, everybody say trump. <laughs> yeah, okay, we're going to stop on that one. Spiritual discernment, gnosko, always trumps what's called gnosis, which is scientific head knowledge. Scientific head knowledge. Big difference between that. This is why we need to share the word with our testimony. Can you catch this? It's not your testimony that gets people saved. It's the word of your testimony, which is the word of God. We need to go out and tell the people in the world that God is not mad at you. A lot of people think God's mad at them because, well, you know, I'm, I'm 30, I'm 40, I'm 50. I've never really received the Lord. God just sitting there, got his arms wide open waiting on you. Just like the prodigal's father standing out in the field looking for the son. He's, he's coming. He's coming. Number three, hell cannot prevail against revealed knowledge from the Spirit of God. Now let's go to Matthew 16.5. Later after they crossed to the other side of the lake, the disciples discovered they had forgotten to bring any bread. Watch out, Jesus warned them. Beware of the yeast. The King James calls it leaven. Anytime we see leaven or the yeast, it's referring to sin. Okay? Beware of the yeast or the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. As they, at this, they began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. <laughs> And Jesus knew what they were saying, so he said, you have so little faith. Why are you arguing with each other about having no bread? Don't you understand even yet? Don't you remember the 5,000 I fed with five loaves and the baskets of leftovers you picked up? Or the 4,000 I fed with seven loaves and the large baskets of leftovers you picked up? Why can't you understand that I'm not talking about bread? So again, I say, beware the yeast, or leaven, of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then at last they understood that he wasn't speaking about the yeast or leaven in bread, but about the deceptive teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I remember a family that used to go to this pastor's house that, that was in a church. I call it a cult. They'd go every Saturday night. They would watch some of his videotapes that he preached during the services. And I told them, I said, you have got to beware of the leaven that's being preached sometime from the pulpits. Hello? We don't just take something because somebody said, well, God says this. Brother, you know what? If God says it, you find it in the Word. Tell me where that Scripture is. If you believe a certain thing, you find the Scripture, and I might start believing it. But if you don't find the Scripture in the verse... Uh-uh. Boy, there's a lot of poison out there. You remember when I made that big plate full, or Deb had this big plate full of potatoes? How many of you were here for that one? About six of you. Big plate full of, of potatoes. That tall. Set it right down here. I said, how many of you would like a bite of fresh, fresh potatoes? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. i got to season it. Grab this little jug, sprinkle it on there, turned it around, had a skull and crossbones on it. I said, now, how many of you want a bite? See, this is what happens when we start hearing this and hearing that and hearing this. That's why Paul says to know them that labor amongst you. Find out what kind of lifestyle they live before you just open yourself up to hear anything they've got to say. Is that all right to say that? So I found this interesting in, uh, on your handout number four. According to Strong's Concordance, leaven, zume, means to ferment as if boiling up. Boiling up. So when I found that definition, I got to thinking about that, and, and I, I felt like it was saying, Jesus was saying, look at the actions of the religious crowd, because they taught doctrines of devils, because they taught doctrines of devils, their attitudes were comparable to a boiling potion which robbed men of faith in Christ. That's what I saw out of that. See, leaven is produced by the souring of bread dough, and you remember what Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians and Galatians 5, a little leaven leavens what? The whole lump. A little error can poison the whole batch. 
Reminds me of the thing I must have said 40 million times. If you want to know what kind of person you are, look at your friends. Now slap yourself and we'll go on. So Jesus is making reference here to the doctrine of the religious spirits seen in the teachings which Paul cautioned Timothy about in 2 Timothy 3.1. This I know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. How many of you know we're there? Somebody said to me the other day, I wish God would show me in the Bible where we are at this particular time in the spirit. He's already shown us everything he's going to. But the just shall live by faith. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good. The new living says in verse 3, they will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. Is that not Isaiah 5.20? They'll call good bad and bad good. Verse 4, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. <laughs> I just thought about a guy years ago when I was preaching at New Life. He uh, saw me one week and he goes, hey, uh, did you, uh, you notice we uh, weren't here last week? I said, well, sure. I know when people's here or not. Well, he said, tell you what, we got up, got dressed, got all cleaned up, shaved, ready to roll, got in the car. We drove right by the church, right by the church. And I looked at my wife and said, you know, I'd rather have breakfast. So we went and had breakfast. And we said, well, you punk. You could have had a full meal if you'd have come here, right? <laughs> Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Again, you want to know what kind of person you are, look at your friends. Are your friends encouraging you with the things of God, or are they pulling you back, keeping you in the world, keeping you away from the Lord? You got to look at this. Again, Carol mentioned it just the other night. I believe you mentioned it when I said about me standing on a table trying to pull you up. You're down there trying to pull me down. Who's going to win first? More than likely, you will. So... As we tie all this together, we can see that participating in the Lord's Supper while not exercising faith, and we'll talk about it, is what Paul discusses in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. We'll get there. Also today, we're going to use unleavened bread. You're not going to get the nice little Italian bread. Deb bought a big loaf of Italian bread for this, and I said, do you have anything that's unleavened? Yeah. So we're going to have unleavened bread today which excludes leaven, which symbolizes faith and purity. No leaven, no sin, faith and purity. There's a lot that can be said about unleavened bread. First of all, it is required during the Jewish Passover celebration. Number, number five, receiving unleavened bread during communion commemorates our freedom. Everybody say freedom. freedom. From slavery and bondage, just as when the Jews escaped Egypt... And didn't have time to let the breads rise before going into the desert. So the writer of Hebrews mentions the basic elements of Christianity. We know that, including baptisms, plural. And we've discussed the different views and opinions about water baptisms, the different kinds, different denominations. But today I want to talk about the Lord's Supper and the different views held by differing uh, denominations. So there are several names used to define the Lord's Supper. On your outline, number six, uh, A, Lord's Supper, established by the Lord at supper time. B, the Lord's Table. C, Communion. The Greek definition is participation in common. And D, Eucharist. Greek definition is a giving of thanks. So look up at me when you're all done. Four different views regarding the Lord's Supper. We're going to hit seven and eight. I'm going to roll through this. The Roman Catholic Church, number seven, celebrates what's known as the transubstantiation view. Isn't that interesting? Aren't you glad to know that? Yes. All right. 
which believes that the bread... Now watch this. They believe that the bread and the wine become the actual body and blood of Christ when the words of institution are spoken by the priest. Number eight. The Lutheran Church practices what's known as the consubstantiation view. I know you're glad to hear that one too. Which believes that Christ's actual body and blood are truly present in, with, and under the bread and the wine. Unlike the Catholic view, the elements do not actually change into Christ's body and blood. However, this position believes that Christ is actually present at the supper, but it misses the figurative use of Jesus' words. It also tends to draw more attention to the bread and wine than to Christ himself. Number nine, the Baptists and independents, say that's me, not necessarily that you're Baptist, but you need to be more Baptist. Baptists are out beating the bushes and bringing people into the kingdom. Thank God for the Baptists. I, I mean that. I really do. I don't agree with their Calvinistic view of once saved, always saved, but that's something we'll talk about someday. Is that all right? Would you like for me to preach on eternal security one of these Sundays? Yes. Okay. The Baptists and Independents practice the symbolic view, which believes that the bread and wine are only symbols of the sacrificed body and blood of Christ. Symbols. They just represent. They also believe that the Lord's Supper is primarily a memorial ceremony of Christ's finished work and also is to be an occasion when God's people pledge their unity with one another and their loyalty to Christ. So I'm telling you what part of this communion is about today. This is when we will actually pledge our unity with one another to have your six, I got your six, and our loyalty to Christ. This position tends to place more emphasis on what the believer does and promises in the supper than on what God does. Number 10, the Reformed and Presbyterian churches practice what's known as the dynamic view, also known as the spiritual presence view. Spiritual presence view. And stands somewhere between the positions of the Lutheran view and the Baptist and independent churches. So I see it very similar to the Baptist view. Scholars say that the originator of this dynamic view, John Calvin, placed more emphasis on Jesus' glorified flesh and blood than what the scriptures teach. But his position helps to explain why the Lord's Supper is so important for the Christian to observe and why it is such a serious offense to misuse it. So I want to look at a few words of caution from the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. All of them. That's the key word right there. All of them. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Christ. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with him, and that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. In other words, they were all given the same opportunity to receive the promises of God. Can I say that to you? You have received the same promises from God that I have received and James has received and Deb's received. We all receive the same opportunity. But some of them here, he said that they were scattered in the wilderness. God was not pleased with them. And why was that? I'm glad you asked. Verse 6. These things happened as a warning to us so that we would not crave evil things as they did or worship idols as some of them did. As the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking and they indulged in pagan revelry. Number 11, the Nelson Bible Dictionary says that there are scores of references in the Old Testament of the children of Israel being involved with idolatry. Idolatry. In fact, it was so common that God opposed it in just the second commandment of the ten. Think of that. The second thing when God gave the commandments. Did you know once that one guy said a while back that Moses was the worst sinner in the Bible? Did you know that? Did, you didn't know that? He broke all ten commandments at one time. Oh, man. 1 Corinthians 
And we must not engage, yeah, I'm sorry. We must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Christ to the test as some of them did and, and then died from snake bites. And don't grumble as some of them did and they, they and then were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Don't you like to learn lessons from other people's mistakes? Man, it's time to get out of that school of hard knocks. Verse 12, if you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you're tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. I've got another word that I'm working on about how you train your mind to direct your heart. But we'll talk about that later. So, my dear friends, flee from the worship of idols. You are reasonable people. Decide for yourselves if what I'm saying is true. When we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? So, Paul was rebuking the Corinthian church for their involvement with idolatry. Again, as we've seen, communion in the Greek means fellowship, participating, and sharing. Verse 17, and though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. So now let's get to the nitty gritty of it. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. so anyone who eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily, everybody say unworthily, please, is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are sick, are weak and sick, and some have even died. Number 12, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven, the word unworthily actually means irreverently. Irreverently. I feel like I'm teaching a science class or something here. So first of all, I'm sure he's encouraging us to participate with a clean heart. But he also includes irreverent participation as having the opinion that partaking of the Lord's Supper is just another practice of the church. It's mundane. It's redundant. Not so much around here. I mean, I just, I felt like for quite some time the Lord said you need to teach and receive the Lord's Supper. So I, I finally got there. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove or approve your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus is in you, except you be reprobates. In other words, we look, at, we look before the Lord and say, Lord, if there's anything in my heart that's displeasing to you, I ask you to forgive me, to wash me in the blood of Jesus, make yourself available, and you're prepared for the Lord's Supper. But it goes even farther than that. Know not your own selves, except you be reprobates. Like my mom used to say all the time, if Randy Hall would take care of Randy Hall, his hands would be full. Number 13, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine, 29, the Greek definition of not discerning, not discerning the Lord's body is diakrino, meaning to separate thoroughly, to withdraw from, to contend with, to doubt, stagger, and waver. Are you all still with me now? What's he talking about? He's talking about participating in the Lord's Supper, not separating or withdrawing thoroughly from the world. Can I say it like this? When you receive the Lord's Supper, get both feet in the kingdom. Get, get your one foot out of the world. Get both feet in the kingdom. He's talking about taking the Lord's Supper, not contending for the faith. Or taking the Lord's Supper, not doubting, staggering, and waving, wavering. And I believe the Holy Spirit said this to me. I thought it was really a catchy phrase. You might want to write this down. Not considering the relevance of the elements. Isn't that kind of cool? The relevance of the elements. I thought that was really cool. I told, I told the Holy Spirit I really like that. That's cool. The Living Bible. Check this out. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine. 29. For if he eats the bread and drinks from the cup unworthily, 
not thinking about the body of Christ and what it means, he is eating and drinking God's judgment upon himself, for he is trifling with the death of Christ. The Amplified says this in verse 31, For if we searchingly examined ourselves, detecting our shortcomings and recognizing our own condition, we should not be judged and penalty decreed by the divine judgment. So he's saying as we partake in the Lord's Supper, we are participating, fellowshipping, and sharing together the benefits of Christ's death, his blood, and his resurrection life body. You know what? Not discerning the Lord's body, not regarding the Lord's body, does that actually mean the physical body of Christ? Or does it also include the body of Christ, the tangible, physical church on this earth? Absolutely it does. In the Old Testament, during Passover, during the Paschal Supper, they, that gave, they gave thanks by reading Psalm 103 and 104. But I want you to read these next two verses with me, if you will. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Can you know, you know that other, other than blaspheming the Holy Spirit, there ain't nothing that you can do that is unforgivable. Don't care where you're at. Don't care what you've done. If you cry out and ask the Lord to forgive you, He is faithful and just to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and forgive you of all your sins. But why is it so hard for us to believe that He forgives all of our... He, we believe that He forgives our iniquities, but why is it so hard to believe that He heals all of our diseases? Have you ever wondered that? I mean, we, we can take scissors and cut this verse apart, but that's not going to change its meaning. His blood has forgiven all of our sins and iniquities if we put our sins under His blood. I'm not just saying, you know, he, he shared it once and you don't have to feel bad when you sin. You don't have to regret it. You don't have to apologize. You don't have to ask forgiveness. You don't have to repent. No, it's not true on any of them. But His body was bruised and wounded for our healing. I said, oh, that reminds me of somebody. I won't do that. <laughs> he heals all of our diseases. Do yes. you think that's true? Yes. So when you receive today, if you've got something physically wrong with you, call out to him and say, Lord, I'm basing this by faith in what I'm doing. And faith in your word because you are not a man that can lie. You sent your word to heal me. And the word says by the stripes of Jesus I am healed. And today as I participate in the body and the blood of Christ. I'm laying hold of the healing or whatever else I need. I'm going to leave this place a whole lot better than when I came in. If you go to church and you feel worse when you leave. You need to find a different church. Or live, replace the pastor. Whatever. <laughs> Number 14, if we participate in the Lord's Supper doubting His promises, wavering in our faith or in unbelief, we literally invite, invite, I'll let you write that one down. You might want to write that one in bold. We actually literally invite sickness, disease, and death into our bodies. Look what the Amplified says. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. 24, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this to call me affectionately to remembrance. What are we reminding him of? By his stripes we are healed. By our confession of faith in him we are forgiven. Verse 25, similarly, this is the Amplified, when supper was ended, he took the cup also saying, This cup is the New Testament, ratified and established in my blood. Do this, everybody say, as often. as often. Do this as often as you drink it to call me affectionately to remembrance. Years ago, I had a guy that had attended here for a long time, brought his girlfriend, and I was talking about communion, and she wanted to talk to me after church. So he, both of them came in my office. She goes, well, you know, uh, the Bible says that you're supposed to receive communion every time you get together. I said, no, it does not say that. The Bible says, as often as you drink it, as often as you do. So I would rather just be led by the Spirit. I mean, I, I had two different words that I wanted to preach besides this one today. And it's like the Holy Spirit said, I've been telling you, you need to serve the Lord's Supper. 
there are so many benefits that he has just laid out on the table. There's a table prepared for you. He's just saying you can come up and receive. You can receive forgiveness. You can receive healing. Whatever it is, I've spread it out on the table. Just pick what you need. It ain't going to be like when I was in the army. Basic training, I ate everything but two befores. Cook beets. Cook beets. I'll never forget that big beet, that big round looking right at me. Chopped him up, ate that sucker. In other words, what Paul's saying is, is this. Do this in faith, believing in what I have promised. Because faith, that's what, that's what I felt like the Holy Spirit says, because faith always puts me into remembrance and I will respond. I will respond. Number 15. Not only is participating in communion a coming into fellowship with Christ, it also unifies us with other believers. Unifies us. And what's, what's Psalm 133? God commands a blessing where there's unity. 1 Corinthians 10, 17, For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. One great antidote for a bad attitude towards a brother and sister is to realize this fact. Jesus died for them as much as he died for me. Can you hinge on that one? Number 16. Not only are we to discern the Lord's body, but realize and accept that we are the tangible body of Christ on earth. We need to start appreciating and, and, and serving one another. Remember that Paul rebuked the, the Corinthian church for not discerning the true nature of the church as Christ's body. We're almost done here. 1 Corinthians 11.20 when you come together, it is not for the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Sound like a heck of a church, doesn't it? Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. Then he wrote in Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And of course he's referring here to the Spirit. The Spirit. There is a difference between male and female, no matter what you identify as. There's not 57 other varieties of whatever else the idiots are saying. Male, female, period. Maybe a little goofy male and female, but still male and female. He's talking about things in the spirit. I remember one time when I was at New Life, pastor in a church, I had a board meeting, brought the guys in. The guys were all upset. One of them said, well, me and my wife are one. We became one when we got married. Well, that's good. What are you saying? I want my wife at this board meeting. Because the Bible says that they're all the same. Male and female, Greek, Greek, Greek and Jew. Said, no, 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 no. Let me tell you, there is a big difference between me and a woman. You know what I mean? Big difference. Yes, you are one in the spirit. But we're talking about something physical here. Oh, let's get off of this. Number 17. 17, 18, 19, right in a row. Participating in the Lord's Supper is a time of remembering. Remembering. The crucifixion, suffering, and resurrection of Christ, including his life and ministry. Remembering. Number 18, secondly, it is a time of refreshing and communion. I'm just going to be honest with you. I am tired of serving the Lord's Supper and going through the routine because that's just something that we do in church. And not hearing of people saying, man, I came up here with 10,000 pounds of weight on top of me. And when I received communion, it lifted off of me. I came up here with, with sciatic down my leg. When I received communion, it left. I think we've been, we miss it because we're not looking for it. We're not expecting it. Like getting up on a Sunday morning, I don't really want to go to church today, but I'll go because I need to. Come in not expecting a dadgum thing. 
and then leaving feeling bad and saying, well, poor Danny just didn't cut the mustard today. I don't know if he's been working too hard. Poor pastor's just an idiot. He didn't know what he said from one minute to the next. I sure didn't get nothing out of this. Maybe you should start coming to church expecting God to do the supernatural. He's a supernatural God. He wants to add his super to your natural. He wants to do exploits through you. We come to receive, but we also should have the attitude, I'm coming to give. I'm going to give something. If it's just a smile to somebody that looks miserable, I'm still going to smile at them. Thirdly, as we participate together, we are actually nourished and empowered by the risen Christ through the Spirit. We need to expect more than what we're expecting. Did you know John Wesley received communion on the average of every four or five days? Get off of there. Oh, these computers, these last few days, computers have just run me up a wall. Get off of there. I can't get it off of there. Oh, well. Number 20. Lastly, participating in the Lord's Supper is a time of recommitment and dedication to Christ and His people, as well as a renewed, hopeful anticipation of His ultimate return for His tangible body on earth. How strange. Actually, I had a picture of President Trump. This popped up on my computer. I really did. Some kind of a news feed. I don't know what that was. I think Trump, Trump's just saying, just tell him the truth, son. Tell him the truth. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a minute. We're going to examine ourselves. <laughs> examine ourselves to see if, there would be, if that we be in the faith. Are you going to look at your heart and say, okay, I got this issue going on. I need to put it under the blood of Jesus. Do it. I got this thing going on. I'm not born again. I need Christ in my life. Invite him. I got this sick thing going on. I'm hurting. I'm getting old. I'm getting feeble. Man, I ain't getting feeble. I'm just like Caleb. I am more able now to take the ground than I was 45 years ago. I am. Bill Weber, you just be quiet. I can see it on your face all the way up here. <laughs> so, examine your heart. Make sure you're in the faith. And partake in a worthy manner of expectation of receiving the blessings of God today. Don't let this be a typical communion service. All right, let's go home. Let's not let it be that. Let's believe God. So, I'm going to do this. I'm going to invite you into the kingdom of God. This is an invitation. If you have never received Christ in your heart and you would like to know him, you would like to know that you have eternal life inside of you, that you're going to live in heaven with God, with all the saints, with all your loved ones that have been born again, that have gone before you. You know, I'm starting to realize, I think I know more people that's in heaven than on earth. It's what happens when you start going up the rector scale. Okay. If you've never received Christ and you would like to, I like just, I'm, I don't believe in this secret agent stuff, crawl under the pew and everybody hide your eyes because God forbid you'd find out that I need Jesus. We all need Jesus. Some guy said, well, he's, he's a crutch to you. You want to know what? He's a crutch on both arms. I can't live without him. He's my heart's desire. The Bible says he that has the son has life. God said to Moses, I set before you this day life and death. Life and death. Blessings or curses. You know who gets to choose? You. You. Who are you going to choose? 
I don't want you coming up here saying, well, you know, I just, I kind of feel silly being the only one here that's not participating in this. And, and what, but I know that by what I've heard, I don't want to go receive the Lord's Supper if my heart's not right. Say, man, you're pounding on, I am pounding on this. I know the voice of the Holy Spirit. And he said, give an invitation. And I know that I'm not just batting against the wind. There's somebody that needs to give their heart to the Lord Jesus. And all it takes is put your hand up and I'll pray with you and then we'll get on with the service. Anybody. Anybody. I was after you, son. I was after you. I was after you. When you walked in today, yeah, this is a God thing. This is a God thing. This is going to be real simple. Simplest thing you ever did. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I want you to say this. Father God, say this. I believe Jesus is your son. He died for my sins. And I ask him now to forgive me for my sins. Come into my heart. Change me. Make me a man of God. Help me to serve you. In the name of Jesus. Bible says that when someone comes to the Lord, that the angels in heaven rejoice. All the angels rejoice. Yes. 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 Let God be true and every man a liar. I'm going to start with this section over here if you come up that side. And, uh, be careful with these cups. They're about the cheapest plastic cup you've ever seen in your life. Don't squish them because you're going to be wearing the juice. So if you'll come up, guys. j Dog, you got something, don't you, buddy? All right, bro. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a clap for that. That then I'm telling you, that is awesome. <laughs> Bless you. Amen. 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 God is so good. You know, He gives us stuff we don't even deserve. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can't hear you. I've only got one bread. Did you make two? I want to dump some in this other one? Yeah, do that. Yeah. Just dump it in that lid. Pick them up however you want to do it. Come on, y'all. Come on over here. Right over there is fine. That side, that side can come up that side if you want. Just loop out around. Now you're cooking. Yeah, darling, said I gotta watch out. You're gonna spray it all over me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Everybody on this side's done, okay? Come on up this way if you will. Play it up, J Dog.
had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this to call me affectionately to remembrance. Let's bless the bread. Lord, we thank you. We bless you. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you paid the ultimate price. And by our faith in you, we have eternal life. We are your children. Lord, we reverence you today. We bless each member of the body of Christ. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we partake? Similarly, when supper was ended, he took the cup also, saying, This cup is the new covenant ratified and established in my blood. Do this and as, as often as you drink it to call me affectionately to remembrance. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are representing and signifying and proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's bless the cup. Father God, I thank you for the shed blood of the Lamb. For you said without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. But Father, we put our faith in your Son, in the shed blood of Jesus. And we proclaim that by the stripes of Jesus Christ, we are healed. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we partake? Hallelujah. We give you glory and we give you praise. Go ahead if you will. Amen. Amen. I say to you let your mind be at peace your heart be at peace for all is well everything is going to be fine tell your neighbor everything's going to be fine it's going to be fine James everything's going to be fine T everything's going to be fine amen we serve a fine God that wants to bless us praise God brother would you pray us out of here Thank you, sir.